Welcome everybody to our uh, Weisenthal Colloquium Series here in the Departments of Chemistry and Physics at Lewis. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Parker from the Physics Department, but we like to kind of take, take a little credit that he does teach in the Chemistry Department as well. Um, Dr. Parker received his PhD from Purdue University. I'll spare all the details. I'll just say the fact that he uh, has worked in industry for quite some time before deciding to come back to academia. Uh, I had the great uh, you know, fortune to be able to work with Dr. Parker early on in my career uh, at Cabot Microelectronics Corporation, and actually he had the, the great pleasure of actually having to be my manager for some <laughs> period of time, so I can save those stories for later on. Um, so uh, Dr. Parker is going to share a little bit uh, about nanostructuring and, and, and space and things of that nature, but uh, again, nanotechnology at the forefront of all you hear in the news and, and, and in the media, and Dr. Parker, uh, I consider to be one of the experts in the area on that stuff. So, Dr. Parker, welcome to Lewis. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I, was, I had the good fortune of managing Dr. Kelleher when I knew he was coming to Lewis. So you know what that means? It was like I didn't have to manage him. I knew he was on his way to Lewis. So any trouble he was going to create, it was okay at that point. All right, no, seriously. Um, so yeah, it was a great, uh, great opportunity. We had to work together. That's how we got to know each other. And that's where I learned my chemistry, right? I'm a physicist by training, and I got to work with some great chemists over the years, especially in industry. Uh, Dr. Kelleher, of course, being among them, and many of colleagues I know he has fond, uh, fond memories for, for that we were able to work with. So let me explain a little bit about my uh, research program here at Lewis, because I kind of changed gears in my life. All right, not only leaving industry to come to teach at Lewis and uh, work in academia, my research interests also changed. And that's kind of meta metaphorically shown here in this picture. You're wondering why has he got donuts here, all right? Well, we have donuts and we have what? Donut holes, right? Most of my career I spent in nanoparticles, solid objects, right? Solid spheres, different particles of different sizes in the nano regime. And then when I came to Lewis, I got more interested in the space that are in the nanometer size. All right, why? Why would that matter? Well, it just not so happens that we did have the director of the observatory from the Vatican here this week talking a little bit about space, not too much, but a little bit about space. And of course, those that know what happened with uh, Virgin Mobile sent a rocket up and had William Shatner on it this week, right? So it was all about Space Week. So I figured I got to put space in the title. But seriously, I am very interested in nanostructuring materials around space. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here today. So what does that mean? Well, before I get into that, I want to acknowledge two of my collaborators in this work, and that's a company called Mesodynamics. And many of you don't know them because they're a small startup company, but many of you also know Oregon National Laboratories and they're my co-collaborators here. I'm gonna break up the talk into two parts, talk about what I do at Mesodynamics first, and then secondly, we'll talk about Argon, all right? Now, I'm bringing a industry career perspective to my research here, all right? And I wanna go through this slide pretty carefully first with you, because I think it's really important that you understand the difference in research and what research actually is. So when you're in industry, when you're in the commercial world and you're going to be very interested in what? Making money effectively, selling a product and, and making money from it. What's really important is not just research and not just development, R&D, you often hear about that, but deployment is also important. And as scientists, as chemists, chemists and physicists and material scientists, you can play an active role there. You don't have to be an engineer to play active roles in the developments of products, all right? Or in the scaling of making them. You can have a scientific background and play an active role there. Because fundamentals apply at every level. And you learn, you become very strong in fundamentals of your science. But you can apply that anywhere, all right? And what's really important, as you take your ideas, things that are going on in the lab, and then try to translate them into the marketplace. You have to understand what the marketplace wants, what a customer wants, what kind of specifications and things do they have for the product that they want to make or the market they want to address. And you also have to know how to make it 
in large quantities, right? You don't want to sell one thing, you want to sell many things, all right? Even if it's a piece of software, you have to know how to implement the deployment of that, okay? So it's really important. And the question is, is where do you make the money? You really make the money when you can do all three, all right? And science plays a big role in that intersection. How? How is it possible? Well, let's say you want to translate Okay, you want to translate your fundamentals into an actual product. You have to understand how the fundamentals play into that particular application. What's important? So you might start crafting yourself as a scientist, thinking a little bit more, less, just a little bit less about the fundamentals, and a little bit more about extrapolation into how that application might work. Okay? And then, of course, there's the deployment, scaling it, making it not only more of it, but how could I make it also very cost effective? And when the product doesn't work, right, and you need to fix it, you need, again, that basic understanding from the fundamentals as to how to fix that process as well, all right? You can do all three of these things as a scientist, and if you are involved in doing all three of these things, your company's gonna make some money. All right, so I'm bringing that perspective here, but I also have a lot of fun because one of the things that goes on at Argon is something called chain reactions innovations. And what this is, is the Department of Energy has set aside money for young entrepreneurs that want to come and work at Argon for two years. All right, they're funded to help them start their company. Basically, it becomes a startup within Argon. And I have the good fortune to work with some of those young entrepreneurs to take some of this experience that I've had and share that with them as a mentor. So that's, I think, where I get maybe the most joy in research these days is helping young entrepreneurs uh, develop themselves because that's where I spend a lot of my time, all right? And one day maybe you'll be there as well, sending in a proposal. Let's talk about the research program, though, what's, what's interesting. Of course, this is all materials related, a lot of the physics and chemistry of what goes on in material systems. And the first thing you're probably familiar with, you buy a pair of shoes, you open the box, there's the shoes. Inside the box or inside the shoes is this thing that says silica gel, throw away, don't eat. I don't know about you, I like donuts and I like donut holes, right? but I've never eaten anything that's come out of a shoe. So I don't know why they would put that on there, but they put that on there, okay. So throw that away. But what's inside? What's inside? What's inside are little beads of glass. Not just glass like you would see in the windows here in the room, but glass that has tiny pores inside. And what are the, what's the function of those pores? What actually goes on? What, what is this do not eat silica packet there for? It's a desiccant, right? It's there to remove moisture from your shoes so they don't build up mold or, or get smelly while they're sitting in the box translate, or transporting from the manufacturer to the shoe store, all right? How does that work? Well, silica itself, glass, is very water-loving. It's a very water-loving surface, all right? Water can absorb fairly readily on that surface. But the fact that there's holes or pores inside of those silica beads themselves gives me channels to trap that water. So I have a lot of interior surface as well. Not just the surface that you see and can touch, but there's a lot of internal surface. And inside that internal surface and that water-loving chemistry surface is the following. If I look at one of these channels, I can absorb water very nicely on the surface of the inside of these holes or pores. And as the humidity in the environment accumulates, I can trap water within that system. So that's how it acts as a desiccant, okay? Now, you're kind of like, that's what you do research on? No, that's not what I actually do research on. But what we do research on is that idea of taking a very porous substance where I can control the size of those pores and let's say I want to push them into that nanometer regime where I want to play with those holes instead of, the, uh, instead of the, the donut holes themselves, the particles anymore. So now I make particles, and we make a variety of different particles that have an interior structure to them. I'm interested in the space, the nano space that we can create. So here's that example of that desiccant, right? where I've got the functional chemistry that's very water-loving on the surface of that silica bead. 
But what if I could change that? Well, there's a whole variety of chemistries that can be purchased, siloxane, silanes, that can be added to the surface and put a new functionality on the surface of not only the exterior, but the interior of the system. So I can basically change something that's water loving to something that's not water loving, hydrophobic in nature. And now my desiccant, instead of absorbing water, can absorb something more like maybe aromatics that are present in the environment or a variety of other things that would not necessarily want to bond into that water loving surface. Now that's been done before as well. So you're kind of like, maybe I've heard of this before. This is not new. What's, what's really new here? What's really new here is what we started working on with a friend of mine from another company, uh, a startup company that I had many years ago, about 30 years ago, um, Dr. John Akins. And he and I came up with this idea of what if we could have a completely contrasting system, not one that's water loving or completely water hating, but what if I have a contrasting surface? So what if I make a particle or a substance, a bead, if you will, that has, again, internal porosity to it. And let's say what I'm showing here in the dark, in the black, is the water-loving surface. But inside, where I'm showing red, I can create a whole variety of different surface chemistries. In fact, some that are maybe more hydrophobic in nature. What will this chemical contrast allow me to do? So we started down this path in asking ourselves this question, how could I have this multitude of functionalities within these porous structures? Again, small in size, high in number because of the large surface area present here. So we started looking at can we make these mesopores, meso just means the size range, six to 20, uh, two to 60 nanometers in size, all right? But what we're gonna do here is put a different chemical functionality here, which I'm showing in red, that's gonna be different from the rest of this host matrix that's present here, all right? So I'm gonna create this kind of surface chemical contrast. And we patented this process. Dr. Aiken started a company here called Mesodynamics. Now, let me try to draw a metaphor for you. Again, we're gonna go back to food because I think that's the theme of the day here, right? Donuts, donut holes. We'll talk about muffins, blueberry muffins, the blueberry muffin effect. How do you make a blueberry muffin? Well, I put in blueberries. If I wanted to make a chocolate chip muffin, I put in chocolate chips. But what happens? Well, the flavor of the blueberry stays within the matrix of the muffin itself but they can get kind of messy, right? Those blueberries, they get kind of slimy in there, so on and so forth. What if I could just put the blueberry flavor in there without the blueberry? What if I could just coat the inside without the addition of the blueberry? And that's effectively what we do here. So focus on this little region here. Looks like a blueberry popped out, but it leaves the blueberry stain, the blueberry flavor behind in the muffin. So this is a brief metaphor of what we're trying to do to try to create this chemical contrast. Of course, in this case, we're talking about difference in flavor. So how do we actually do this to make these glass beads? Well, remember, what did I say? Research, development, deployment. So from the deployment standpoint, we looked at it as we've got to make these things very inexpensively if they're going to be commercial. So the step we took was to use a scalable technology, something that already existed. Some of you might already be familiar if you make nanoparticles or work with nanoparticles, maybe you work at Dr. Kelleher in CMP area and you work with nanoparticles. Silica nanoparticles are very often made through this process called the sole gel process. What is the sole gel process? Well, we start with some silicon based, let's say, some um, metal organic compound that's based in the metal being silicon, okay? And what we typically do through um, hydrolysis and condensation processes is we can make very, very tiny macromolecular structures of silica, silicon dioxide, all right? And then we take those macrostructures, which we call a sol, and we can drive them in various different directions. 
We can make films from the sols. These are, again, really tiny particles or macromolecules. We can form something called a gel. What's a gel? I basically, instead of laying them all down as solid particles on the surface, I almost form like what? A porous media, right? What is it? I've got solid that's interconnected together and then liquid separating them. Once I have that liquid in there, I can dry this with heat to a completely solid substance. I can dry these into bigger nanoparticles or I can leave them as such and then dry them, extract the solvent and leave them as a porous structure. So we have aerogels, nanoparticles, bulk materials, dense films. There's a whole variety of things we can do with this sol gel method. What we're gonna do with our process is start here and then introduce other nanoparticles that will fill in spaces. So in other words, I'm gonna grow the muffin around the blueberry. The blueberry is what's gonna provide the magic in this case. So this is what we're doing here. So again, we're starting with our sol. We add in the unique functionality we want to bring. So remember the sol itself is gonna be a water loving matrix. It's gonna produce a water loving matrix. And then what we do is form a gel, the, the muffin, okay, around the blueberry, all right? But what we then do is once we have removed the solvent, we now have a completely solid structure, or while it's still wet, what we can do is drive out the blueberry and leave just behind the flavor functionality in this case, the, the unique contrasting surface chemistry which will leave behind, by the way, what? A hole, okay? We're back to the hole. So now I've got this unique pocket, if you will, of surface chemistry that's very different from the rest of the matrix that we have in place here, all right? So that's what we do. We started making materials this way and started looking at some of the interesting properties associated with them. And this was one of the most stunning things we ex didn't expect. All right, and I wanna walk you through this example. So here's ordinary, so again, think of those glass beads if I took them and ground them up a bit into more of a powder, all right? The ones you take out of the shoes, grind them up a little bit, make a powder. So they're still very porous materials, but I've added a little bit more surface area by grinding them down. All right, I'm gonna take that, that's the ordinary silica, water loving, but I'm gonna completely treat it with a unique surface chemistry that's gonna to try to attract and organic dye to it. And that's what I'm showing here in B. So in B, I've treated the silica, all right? And now I've washed it with blue dye, okay? Some of you might have worked with this, blood, uh, this dye, Kamasi Blue. It's an organic dye. All right, so I've treated it, let it sit in the dye, I take it out, dry it, wash it a bunch of times and I get this light blue color. Some of the dye has stuck to the surface is basically what's happened here, all right? If I add two times the amount of dye, should I have increased the concentration of dye? Hopefully I did, okay? I wash it in the higher concentration of dry, dye, I dry that material, remove the water, dry it. Yeah, it got a little bit more blue. Got a little bit more blue, but when we use the technology I showed you on the last slide, what we call mesosil, all right, where I've created these unique pockets, instead of coating the entire surface, I put the functionality in a localized place, in the size of pores that are about 80 nanometers. So I have these little 80 nanometer pockets that are gonna absorb that dye. And here was the weird effect. We kind of expected that to absorb at least as good or maybe a little bit better of the dye. But this was the interesting effect. Notice what happens here. I've got two times the amount of dye, I see a slight color change. When we went to half the amount of dye present in the solution, but put in this unique silica, this high contrasting silica that we've added, this what we call mesosil, look at how much dye I was able to absorb. You can see the color change that took place there. So we're not only doing a better job, we're doing a much, much better job. And in fact, if I go to compare one times the amount of dye on the ordinary treated silica and one times the blue dye on the mesosil, you can see the difference in color contrast here. Significantly different. 
all right? Big difference here. So the question becomes, why am I getting such an intense color? And I really want you to understand what's going on here. So what have I really done here? It's kind of like the following. I'm gonna take this gallon of paint and I'm gonna paint this wall, all right? You've painted, you painted the rooms and let's say I got this big white wall and I've got paint and I'm gonna to try to paint the wall. I should change the color of the wall. Sometimes it takes what? Maybe two coats, sometimes maybe three coats. So I coat the wall and I get a certain color to it and let's say it comes out like this. But what we were actually able to achieve with that other material is the following. Think about having a half a gallon of paint, the same amount, instead of two gallons, I take half a gallon of paint and I get that color on the wall. How would that be possible? Does that make sense? So there's something uniquely happening when you apply not only the chemistry, it's not so much about the binding, it's about how that chemistry resides inside that 80 nanometer sized hole. It's taking on a much different effect in its ability to absorb light. So there's some interesting new physics and chemistry going on inside of pores that are that small in size. All right? And of course, we have put multiples of those in place so it gives us a large vehicle format from which to study what's going on there. So it was a kind of a shocking effect because we really did not expect that, that there was something that new. We don't understand it, quite honestly. We don't understand what the excitation effects are. Why is, why is excitation absorption in this case, all right? So much greater inside these tiny little porous systems that we've created. Is it, does it have to do with the chemical contrast? Does it have to do with the size? These are things we'd like to explore and understand a little bit more. But the idea is, Dr. Akins had started this small company, we've got to exploit this. How do we now use this? We've created this invention in the research space. We kind of know how to deploy it because it seems like it would be easy enough for us to scale this process. Where do we go find the applications? And that's where we have spent I've been here nine years, we've been spending about nine years trying to figure out where to plug this into, okay? What kind of applications? And over that nine years, we've found some pretty interesting applications working with companies. One of the ones that's the most interesting is the following. I'll go through the list in a minute, but let me just start here at the bottom with something called an agraceutical. Anybody know what that means? An agraceutical? An agraceutical is the combination of agriculture meets pharmaceutical. All right, so taking what everybody knows about pharmacy, right, pharmacology, and applying that into agriculture. And one of the applications is as follows, right? Here we've got a crop duster that sprays a field, an entire field, why? So they can impact what's going on at the seed. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, does it? You're spraying this entire area to hit this little target. It's like you want this big coverage to hit this little spot. What if I could directly address the spot itself, right? So what if, for example, I could take a seed that I'm gonna plant in the ground and coat it with a material that has a certain functionality to it? Everyone's probably seen coated seeds at some point, maybe. If you've thrown some recent grass seed down, why is it blue? It's blue grass seed. What have they put on the grass seed? They put a reactive element to it so it'll help it grow, right? A fertilizer or an insecticide. So Mesodynamics is working with a company to develop seed coatings, all right? And those seed coatings are gonna protect that seed until it can germinate and it can fight off the insecticide, right? It's acting like an insecticide and keep bugs from eating the seed before it can actually germinate and grow, all right? So there's a variety of applications, that's one of them. There's one in pharmaceuticals they're working on now What's happening in that one? What you're gonna do is use that functional material to bring in a host, a bioactive ingredient that's gonna reside inside those pores. But it's gonna go through the digestive system and then be released afterward. That's another application that's going on here. We've had some, I worked with a SURE student a couple summers ago during the first round of summer with COVID. And we worked on something really interesting Dr. Akins had found an application for. Believe it or not, it was for making pizza better. How do you make pizza better? Well, one of the things you buy, when you buy a pizza, you get your Domino's box, you open it up, it smells pretty good, doesn't it? What is the smell that's activating your senses to say, I want a piece of pizza? 
It's not only a visual aspect, there's a, there's a smell aspect to it. It's the smell of garlic, believe it or not. It's just simply the smell of garlic. So working with manufacturers in food industry, for example, people that sell cheese to Domino's Pizza to make those pizzas, how do we make our product a little bit better? One of the areas that we worked on with him, we were doing more of the quality assay for this aspect was, how do we incorporate garlic oil inside of these unique high chemical contrasting particles? And can we release it at different temperatures? So one of the things that they were looking at was an active ingredient that goes on your pizza, you open the box, nice smell of garlic, all right? So there's a whole wide range of places you can apply a very basic but unique material technology. All right, I'm gonna pause right here because I'm gonna switch gears to my other projects that I work on at Argonne. Do you have any questions here? Chris. Do we use? All right, great question. Let me jump back to that. So what we do, just so we're clear, we can start, we can tailor the size by the size of the nanoparticle we're actually using there. So I'm using the donut hole in this example, right? And I'm coating the surface of that, and I'm putting that in, and I'm growing the high surface area material around that, right? and then I'm removing the, the solid particle. So we can't really tell the surface area difference between the matrix and the particle holes that we've introduced, that we've introduced intentionally. But we do use surface area to capture all surface area, meaning the surface area that's open from the matrix and the holes that we've created ourselves, but not uniquely different. I can't, I can't measure each one independently. I measure it as a bulk effect. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to like something unfunctionalized. Is there a reduction in the surface area? Typically, no, and I'll tell you why. This surface area, this matrix, is enormous. The amount of contrast functionality, extra surface area we're introducing, is relatively a small amount, or if at anything, it's equal to it. So you don't really see much of a change in the actual surface area. But what you see, of course, is the chemical contrast in the surface chemistry. That's a great question. Anyone else? All right. Joe, did you have one? No. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now, and we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. And it still has to do with space, nanospace. This is a project I got involved with, oh, it's about three, four years ago now. And that's back at Argonne National Labs, all right? And I started my career at Argonne. Um, I, it wasn't the group I was working in at the time, although it was the same division, which is in material science division. But there was a group there that was doing high temperature superconductivity. And when they approached me about working with them, I said, I don't know anything about high temperature superconductivity. I've done I actually have a patent in it, but it was the addition of materials into high temperature superconductors. How they actually work and all that, I have vague information. But they've spent decades trying to understand what goes on in high temperature superconducting materials. So I said, why? What, what's interesting? And they said, well, we're experts, all right, in magnets. We're experts in the superconducting materials and vortex phenomena that occurs inside materials. And they have a whole separate group that works on, guess what? Space between nanoparticles. I was like, okay, that's cool. I understand nanoparticles. Space between nanoparticles, I'm kind of working on that now. So let's see what would make sense. So here's what happened. Here's what they presented. Let me walk you through this. It's a little tutorial on something called surface plasmon resonance. Has anybody ever heard of this? What do you know about it? Okay, yep. So it's a light effect, right? There's a nanoparticle effect. Let's start with what happens if I put a metal like a gold 
or a silver on top of some kind of substrate surface. Let's say I'm going to put it on a piece of glass. All right? I can deposit a film there. When I shine light on it, what is light? Light is an oscillating electromagnetic field. right? If I focus on the electric field, what's it going to do to the electrons that are free on that metal? It's going to slosh them around. right? It's going to make a wave. Now, the electrons want to respond to that electric field. But what happens, they will respond with the same frequency, but they can't have the same wavelength because why? They can't move at the speed of light. So the wavelength of this oscillating electric field, or these oscillating electrons, those are called surface plasmons. All right? And they have a wavelength that is smaller than the wavelength of the light because they cannot move at that speed. What if I made the wavelength of the surface plasmon the same wavelength as the space between nanoparticles that I would put on that surface? Now I have something a little bit different, right? Now if I put, instead of a solid metal film, what if I put gold nanoparticles on that surface in contact with each other, and then that surface plasmon generated by light would create enormous electric fields inside the space between the nanoparticles. All right? So visualize like eggs in a carton or pool balls in the pool rack. Right? It's the spaces in between that are going to create these huge electric fields. This is a model of what's going on in this system. It's not a measurement. It's a model. So what I have are one, two, three gold nanoparticles that are sitting next to each other. And what I'm showing in color contrast is the strength of, for example, the electric field generated by the surface plasmon. And what do you notice? In the spaces in between, I get one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude change in the strength of that electric field. Why would that be important? Well, the visualization I want you to have is not going to be a food one this time. It's going to be about your cell phone. You walk around here, sometimes you go in the basement of the the science building, it's like, oh, I only get one bar, or I'm not getting any texts in here, right? What if I could walk to a little space between two nanoparticles where my one bar went up to a million bars? All of a sudden, my strength of that field in this one region becomes enormous. Well, what happens to molecules that land in those high electric fields? They become super active and super visible, just like you would with your text messaging, right, in that space. So you can enhance, there's a whole variety of spectroscopies, right, that are looking at material properties through light interaction. And when they hit these zones, they become super active, all right? So we have something, for example, that's called surface enhanced Raman scattering. Raman scattering, for those that have, you know, taken their spectroscopies or work with Raman, Raman scattering, we know. What is it? It's the interaction of light with the substance, and it tweaks the vibrations of the molecules. Well, think about that. If I have such a large signal inside of these spaces, it also means what? That I actually don't need a lot of molecules to be in those spaces, to be active. So again, the fewer I have, the more visible they can actually become. I can make them visible in small quantities, another way to say that. So now I have this ultra-high detection system that I can generate if I can make these surfaces. And industry has figured out how to do this. And there's a lot of drug research and a um, variety of just chemical research that goes on nowadays that utilize this technique, where you have localized, localized surface plasmons that fill in these voids, high detection systems. So now, literally, you can walk out with your cell phone have a probe with one of these surface elements, put it down, and you can do spectroscopy off your cell phone out inside the environment. That's how enhanced they have made the signals with this type of technology. But what we got involved in in Argon is not so much the interest of the spaces in betweens, but how do you make these things? So how do we lay down gold nanoparticles next to each other? And one of the ways we looked at it is through this thing called the if you've got donuts and you've got muffins, you also have to have coffee, right? It's called the coffee stain effect, all right? What's the coffee stain effect? Well, here's what happens. I put a drop of coffee down, all right? And what is coffee? 
It's liquid, mostly water of course, and it's filled with these little coffee ground particles. And as that liquid dries, first of all, the evaporations at the edges of those drops is enormous. Because the evaporation is high here, it's pushing material to that interface. And when it pushes material to that interface, it takes everything with it. So what ends up happening is I end up putting most of those very, very small dispersed coffee grounds into that edge. And as the system dries, I end up producing the coffee stain effect, all right? And people have studied this for a number of years, right? How, does, how do systems dry effectively? And here's what they found. If we were to put in, instead of coffee, we put in gold nanoparticles in this place, could we get them to dry in a nice uniform film where they're sitting nested right next to each other? And so we started looking at that, and that's been done, that's been modeled, but we took a very different approach to it. And let me explain the experiment of what we're doing here first. So let me lay this all out. What we do is take a colloid, everybody kind of knows what a colloid is, right? It's solids dispersed in a liquid. I take a colloid of gold nanoparticles and I centrifuge them out and I form a pellet at the bottom and I rinse it out. Because what we want to have here is an effect where we don't see any of the dispersion chemistry, there's something that makes it colloidal, present in that system. So we remove that material and we wash it several times and we end up, what, concentrating it, what we call a pellet here. But it's still, it's not solid, it's a highly concentrated colloid. And then we deposit it inside of a little Teflon tube. All right, we call it a ferrule, but it's a tube. And we put that liquid inside the tube and we let that liquid dry. Now that's different, that's different, measurably different than what we do back here where we're looking at the single drop on a surface. So we're gonna look at how this material is going to dry in this confined environment. And the other thing we can do here is place a camera over it and watch it dry. And we can put a top on it to keep it nice and sealed so we can control that evaporation rate. All right, so we've got a much better controlled system than a free drop on the surface. So here's the difference again. So what's happening here is this is the normal, what we call the sisal drop, drop, you know, liquid on top of a tabletop. We're gonna do it inside this confined system. Of course, donut has to appear always, right? This is called capillary lithography. I'm using the capillary action of the walls that it's confined in, and it's gonna dry differently. Instead of drying from the outside inward, we're drying from the inside outward, all right? So our drying doesn't start here and move this way. We're moving from the center and drying outward. It changes this thing we call F sub P, which is that overall pinning force, okay? The overall pinning force, what is the pinning force? Well, it has to do with the surface tension of the liquid, and then we're interested in the solid contacting that substrate. So we have the Van der Waals interactions of those particles with that surface. So we have this undergoing tension of surface of the particle wanting to stick to the surface and the liquid wanting to drag it along. And don't forget, with the high evaporation rates here at this point, or here at this point, here at this point, we're also feeding it with a lot of material. So the question becomes, as this front moves this way, out as the inward means what? Inward is the direction of the pinning force, but the motion is in this direction. It's different than what's normally done here. So we wanted to take a look at this. This is our model system. And what we're gonna look at is looking down into the cell to see how that drying pattern takes place. Everybody understand that? So we're looking down to see how that dries. And here's what you typically see. This is a typical drying pattern. I've kind of stopped it part way. I get two distinctive patterns that are forming here. What you're seeing is dark, okay, is where the gold has deposited. What you're seeing as light areas in the background here, that's the substrate it's, it's drying onto, which in this case is glass, all right? What do you see? Big difference, right? Big difference. The question is, is why? Step one, okay? Because they were run under the same conditions. 
So this aspect of the self-assembling of these gold particles has created two very, very distinctive patterns here under the same conditions. Now notice in this one, what do I have? It looks like a tree, right? It looks like I cut a tree and there's, these are concentric rings that have formed. So the question is, remember we're drawing from the middle outward. Why would it not produce particles in here, yet it forms this solid ring? And then all of a sudden, I don't have particle depositing and then I get particle depositing. That's one interesting phenomena. That's the concentric ring. And then what the heck is this pattern here? Does this make any sense at all? Well, it does. Because as this meniscus, you can see on the edge here, this would be the edge of, remember, this is all liquid on this side here, because I've stopped this as it's drying. We're looking at it drying outward. This is where it's already dried in the interior, all right? And again, dark is where the solid has placed itself. And look at this edge here. Look at these ripples that are in place here. Did these ripples have something to do with these things that look like triangles inside here? Let's take a look at an example of how it actually dries. So we're going to look at this first one over here, which is going to produce that concentric ring pattern. This one already started. The camera already started early on. Whoops, what happened here? I think I need to do this. Give me one second. I have to play the animation right from here. All right, so let's watch it. This is time-lapsed, okay? This takes a long period of time, hours and hours and hours, but we sped it up. And you can see what's happening is the meniscus is moving this way, and this is now the drying pattern. And as you watch that, what are some of the things you're seeing? It seems like it goes really slow when it's actually depositing the material, and then it moves fast. Do you see that effect? When it's depositing a material, that wave is moving slow, and then it moves really quick. This is a phenomenon which they call the stick slip. It's depositing material, and it somehow, for some reason, gives up the ability to deposit material, and it just slips. It moves forward. We lose that pinning force. Something's happening in that event where we're losing the pinning force. Now, that's the concentric ring pattern. Let's watch what happens over here. This one, unfortunately, I didn't get to start um, right from the beginning, but whoops. This one, I've slowed down even further. Now watch this front here as this moves. That's not coming out great on the camera. It looks better on my computer, but you know what? Let me try something for you real quick. Hang on, just so you can see that better. Yeah. One second. Is that a little clearer? Contrast is a little better? No, it's not. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, maybe on the TVs on the side, it's going to look a little bit better. Watch from the TVs on the side. The projector really stinks here. Let's look at it this way. So you can see what those ripples are doing on that edge. Those ripples on that edge are leading toward that unique pattern that we're seeing, right? If we get those instabilities on the edge, we can actually see the effect of what's causing this triangulation pattern to form here. And so, of course, we wanted to study this. We wanted to understand this a little bit more. So we started looking around, and if I look at, instead of a solid liquid system, what if I looked at a liquid liquid system? So this is an example, it's a YouTube video, you can go find it yourselves, all right? And it's 
a bunch of physics that was done already um, back in 2017. And this is a liquid-liquid effect. So what do we have? We've got a blue dye, organic dye, that gets solubilized into water in the presence of ethanol. So I have a water ethanol mix. The ethanol solubilizes the dye. But what's going to happen when that system wants to dry? The ethanol, of course, is going to evaporate much faster. It's going to have an impact on the solubility of that dye over time. Watch what happens in this effect. So they're not drying it on a glass substrate. They're actually drying it on an oil to really show you the contrast. Now watch what happens here. So as I do this deposit, I put a drop of this mixture here. You can see the edge of the drop. And you can see this formation that's taking place. You see the edge with the ripples, just like we saw. But in this case, it's leading off as these droplets. This was all modeled. The fluid dynamics of this was all modeled okay, back in 2017 related to this idea of the pinning and the evaporation rate and so on and so forth. And what do you see? Well, those first drops that occurred, remember this is a drop. So this is from the edge out, right? From, I'm sorry, from the edges inward. Ours was different. It was from the inward out. And what do you see? These droplets across the surface here, which are the dye, are really small in size. And in the middle, towards the end, they get bigger. So you not only are producing a unique effect on the way this thing is drying, but also, what are you seeing? There's a distribution of size going on here. So we're starting out with larger triangles from the middle out. They're starting out with smaller in. So it's interesting effects. So we borrowed some of the physics here from this thing called the Marangoni effect. Um, and here's what we started to look at. We started to really study and investigate what's going on with our patterns. So this is an optical image. This is an optical microscope image. Again, this is about a quarter inch in diameter, all right, just to give you perspective. So that's about a quarter of an inch in diameter. You can see the gold, which is laid down here. But I get this weird triangular scaly pattern. Well, this is this fractal behavior, something called Sierpinski triangles, all right, that happens when you build fractals from blocks, little blocks. In the other system, we saw it grew from little droplets, round droplets. Ours seem to be more blocky in nature, all right, from our edges. If I take that same sample and I blow up this region here and I put it under a polarizing microscope, I get a different view. What am I actually seeing here? Again, you might want to look on the screen to get the contrast, but I see these little darker green and these more blue-green areas. What we're actually showing in this image is these areas here are single layers of the gold nanoparticles, whereas these little areas over here are double layers. They're piled up on top of each other. So not only are we seeing this triangle pattern, this Sierpinski fractal type behavior to this, but we're actually seeing material piling up on top. So as you saw the rings sticking and then slipping, it's actually happening within the space of this small triangle that's taking place here. And you can see how small these actually are. Again, if this is a quarter of an inch, these are really small in size. So this is now going on at a smaller scale level. If I zoom in on that region, which is that monolayer of gold, and I blow that up here, I can see now the difference in the contrast. Here's a double layer of gold particles. Here's a single layer of gold particles. And if I go in here, I can actually show it with SEM that it's those single layers of gold particles. So again, as a reminder, it's these hot spots in between that will create those high electric field regions. All right? And this is what we want. So how can we get everything to look like that is the key here. But we got really interested by this unique behavior. Why is this occurring? So we started down the investigation from that by just first of all understanding what's going on even in the concentric ring patterns. And what I'm showing here is, again, from that video that I showed you, this is a single pixel, I'm sorry, a single uh, time event that was taken out of that. And what we're showing here is this is what we call the Newton ring. So here's what's happening. Remember, I've got a liquid inside. It's going down like this. It's drying, it's drying. And as soon as it touches the surface, as soon as it touches the surface, it's going to start moving out. This picture here, this image, is when it just touched down. So in other words, that liquid has bowed down and is just above the surface of the glass. 
and I get a light interference pattern just as it touches there. So we estimate based on these rings, we're talking about something that's probably one micron thick layer of water. 60 seconds later, one minute later, look what happens. All of a sudden, I'm starting to see one, two, three, four, five little dots of gold particle assemblies starting to form, okay? Within another minute, one minute later, it has not only dried, but look at what it formed. It went from this to this in one minute of drying time. But notice the shape of this. Are there not four sides to that? It looks like a ring, but if you really look at it closely, it also replicates four different sides to it. So there's something going on here, like I showed you with that blue oil, or that blue dye on top of the oil, I was starting to form droplets, but the droplets quickly broke up and spread out into a ring. Now again, this is occurring within a one minute time frame. Our, our time between picture frames on our analysis was this one minute. So we weren't able to capture what was happening in between here. But we definitely see this Marangoni instability starting to take place right away. But then, boom, all of a sudden it formed this concentric ring. And then of course it would form the concentric ring pattern going forward from there. We did a lot of modeling on this and published a paper in Physical Review in 2020. And one of the things we did right off the bat was looked at, as I move in this direction, okay, what am I really looking at? I'm also looking at time. So every pixel along this frame here represents, frame by frame, is an increment of time. So really this axis here is time, and on this axis, what are we looking at? We're looking at what pixel we are here and where the front is actually moving. So what we can actually plot here, and what have we got? It's position versus time. It's the radial position versus time. So what do we really have? We have the velocity of that drying phenomena as it's taking place. And what do you know about position versus time, right? Everybody knows that's basic physics. I'm really looking at the velocity. The slope of this line is telling me something about the velocity of the drying front as it moves. Well, I can see that it's moving very quickly here, and then it slows down. And then it moves very quickly here, and then it slows down. So what did your eyes tell you you were seeing? Your eyes told you that when it's depositing, I've slowed down. I'm in the stick motion. And then it slips, and then it moves, okay? Now, what are we showing? What are the different colors here? The different colors here are the eight different directions we've gone off. And you can see they kind of line up. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of directionality. Or is there? Is there some additional information about moving in different directions has different effects on the speed? It seems like they all kind of flatten out, right, in this region here within this time frame or this pixel number. And then, again, this, is my, this would be my stick region. This would be my slip region here. So we did a lot of modeling with these types of graphs, right? Understanding the movement of this wavefront as it moves through, this drying front as it moves through, and brought it down to really this mechanistic level of what's going on. Well, what I'm showing here are those gold particles that now want to stick onto that surface they're undergoing what? They're undergoing the surface tension from the fluid as well as their desire to stick to that surface, right? And if you sum the forces within this region as you would with a good physics problem, what you're finding is you're actually able to contact that pinning force. And what does that pinning force have to do with? It has a lot to do with how much you're feeding that interface with material. What kind of surface tension do you have actually in your fluid at that point? Are you concentrating that fluid with something else and changing that surface tension? So we're trying to understand that stick-slip motion for these particles as they move through the system here, all right? A lot of modeling is built into that. I could go into much more detail here, but I just wanted to whet your appetite as to what we're doing here. So again, going back to my original model, this is really deep science, right? We know there's an application for this at the end, but we're really trying to understand the fundamentals of what's going on here in this particular system, all right? Next thing we're interested in doing, I'll just show you what's the next steps. As I said, the group I work with, they're experts in magnetic fields and creating vortices, right? 
If you go online and you look up, go on YouTube and look up this gentleman, Alexei Schnezko, all right, he's one of the scientists at Argonne that does this. What he basically does is he takes iron nanoparticles, kind of like iron pepper, iron shavings, right? Puts them onto different liquids and then applies magnetic fields. And not only do these metal particles, these magnetic particles align in the fields, they form really, really interesting shapes. You would think you were looking at a biology experiment under a microscope. And all it is, all it is, is iron filings, iron particles on top of water. And the effect of the magnetic fields and what it does in the self-assembly here, you would not believe you were looking at something that simple of a system. It looks like a complex biological system. He can make little motors, little things that spin and interact with each other. It's really incredible. So what do we want to do? Hey, why not? We've, we've got the ability to get good magnetic field gear from them. So we've got a system here where we have a one Tesla magnetic field. For One doesn't seem like a lot, one Tesla. One Tesla is a lot. If you go get an MRI, that's like a two Tesla field. It's a really strong magnetic field. And what we're going to do is look at our evaporation process for these gold nanoparticles inside of these magnetic fields. What are we expecting? Well, if you remember back to the old right-hand rule and what you learned in physics and the Lorentz force, those particles will have a charge on them, right? They're coated with a surface chemistry to keep them colloidally dispersed. It's a byproduct from the way they were made. That charge functionality on those particles, give, I'm sorry, that functionality on those surfaces gives them a charge. How will that charge interact inside of that magnetic field? So we can introduce additional forces into our system and study the effects going on here. So that's our next leg of this journey. All right. I'm just going to finish up there. I've got one trivia question that goes back to my original slide. Which came first at Dunkin' Donuts, the donut or the donut hole? I'm old enough to remember that. I remember when they launched the product, the unique product. What was the unique product? Was it the donut hole or the donut? What was the thing that they came up with second? Did they start their business on the donut or the donut hole? Dr. Kelleher, do you know? Duncan Munchkins came after, right? So they started with the donut and later came up with the donut hole. So he wins the donut. You get the donut. You can hand this out to whoever you want. <laughs> There's the donut. Any questions on the argon part? It's hard to swallow, right? It's hard to digest all in one spot. But if you go read that paper, you might get some interest in that. All right? I have one question. Yeah. If you change, because you can see, like, they, they aggregate, they come together, and then they make that. Could you functionalize the particles to have spacers on them to control the rate of that aggregation, but also, like, the shape? So instead of making concentric, could you have, like, squiggly, non-covalent bonds on there that could change the... The yeah, first, first thing we started to look at and what most people look at, and I, for those that are interested, this is, you know, there's, there's, there's working in research, right? And it's, some of you want to maybe just do a capstone project, right? So I had a student work on this aspect of Dr. Kelleher's question as a capstone project. So one of the first things we looked at was it was a system we knew without changing the surface functionality of the particle itself. We looked at just changing the solvent that it's in change that interaction of the surface tension and what does that do on the effect. But definitely we could go to that next phase of looking at the spacers. And a lot of people do that, they've done that already, because again, when you want to tailor the surface plasmon resonance, sometimes you want to tune the gap between those particles and that's where you use the, the surface chemistry to adjust the spacing between them. So I was thinking you have like membranes. Yeah, like exactly. There's, there's a lot of work going on in that area. For those that aren't familiar, gold nanoparticles are used like crazy, crazy. People functionalize them all the time through, through thiol chemistry. All right, so there's, there's a lot of work in, in that particular area. So yeah, definitely. What effect it would have on that whole pattern that it forms, it would be very interesting to look at. But we looked at, for example, just changing the surface tension of the fluid. Don't do it in water, do it in something else, right? Like ethanol or small concentrations where you're significantly changing the surface tension of the fluid, yeah. All right, so if you're interested in any of this, you wanna work on a capstone project or do some you know, deeper research, come see me sometime. But thanks for your attention today. Enjoy your weekend, take care.
next week is National Chemistry Week. I uh, just want to make sure everybody knows that. And on Thursday night, here at Lewis, there will be an event in the university dining room. <laughs> there will be free food and free gifts and free everything for National Chemistry Week and ice cream at the end. It is like color changing molds and like uh, stress balls and you squeeze them and change colors. Because the theme for National Chemistry Week this year is fast or slow, genetics will make it go. And it's all about genetics and things of that nature. It will start at 6 p.m. There's a student poster session from 6 to 7. At 7 to 7.30, there will be a um, award ceremony for uh, Joliet Section of the American Chemical Society. And then from 7.30 to about 8.15, 8.20, there is a guest speaker. So uh, please, if you can attend, um, I will send out to all the students, but I'll also post around the building the link you need to do. Just RSVP so they know how much food to get. Um, but there should be tons of food, and, and it should be a good time. So it's next Thursday night, all right, everybody? We will also have a speaker next Friday, so everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy yourself. And again, thanks, Dr. Parker, for the talk.